Hello folks, so hopefully at the moment I am now live. Um, <laughs> sorry for the slight delay there, it's obviously the first time I'm doing it from Hello, my end. Folks. Do so let me know, um, so I'll try and not get any desktop audio to come through, do let me know what the quality of the stream is, whether it's coming through with good audio, whether it's buffering all the time, all that sort of stuff. YouTube's telling me that it's not looking great, but maybe that is just YouTube. Maybe you've told me differently. Okay. So what we're gonna be doing in this stream is we're going to be carrying on with the blueprint project from last time. So I'm just reverting at the moment some changes that I was doing just before this stream to try and uh, figure out what we're gonna be doing next. So I'm gonna stay here, unstage all of that. In fact, you can't see my screen at the moment. So I'm gonna show you. Stream's great, good for here, solid stream, awesome. That is fantastic to hear because YouTube is telling me that it's a bad stream. So I don't know what they're on about. So we'll see, anyhow. So hopefully now you should be able to see my screen. Let's see, I'm just gonna have my preview open down here on my laptop as well, so that I can see what's going on. Yeah, I can see my screen, hopefully you can see the screen too. And I'm gonna keep up with your stuff. So I'm just gonna go ahead and discard some changes that I've got here to the AI controller that I was trying to do and see what uh, prototype a little bit ahead, that's what I was trying to do. So what I'm gonna go and do is go ahead and open up the Dalek Simulator again. So this is the project we've been working on up till this point, and maybe Ben, my magical assistant, will be able to put the link to this GitHub project in your chat. But I think I can find it. I can probably put it up here somewhere too in the settings for this, maybe in the remote settings, origin, where do I do this? I'm totally forgetting where this stuff is. It's been a long day. Add remote, here you go. So it's game dev twitch forward slash Daleks. That's where it will be at. Ben is on it as well. So he'll be on it in terms of getting you a link in the chat. There you go. And in the meantime, Unreal should have opened up. And this is where we left it off in some really bizarre and dodgy state where our Dalek is just nose diving to the ground and not really homing in on things properly. It's supposed to be going to the zero zero point and let's have a look at where the zero zero point is. I'm gonna take any old block in here, reset its location to zero zero. So that's where it should be heading. Let's see if that's what's happening. I F8 out of here, out of the Dalek, you can see that it is trying to make a beeline for it, but then subsequently, okay, here it comes, it's trying to come back. It's trying to come back. So it does look like it's trying to go for the zero, zero point, but then some strange stuff sort of happens when it goes off into the sunset like that, and then it curves back around. So part of this is the way we've set it up. We've set it up with a cross product. So you've probably not all been here before, so let's have a little bit of a review. First of all, it's gonna be helpful for me, it's gonna be helpful for you. We might be able to identify where some things might be going wrong. Okay, so the main class that we're interested in at the moment is the AI controller. I'm mean, gonna notice I call it a class even though it's Blueprint because basically Blueprint is a class. So what we've got going on here, let's see. Basically every frame on event tick we have got the execution pin coming through. We're doing a cast of the thing that we're controlling to a flying pawn class, which is the this blueprint here. And the flying pawn class is special because it allows us to move it left and right, or well, move it and move it up and down as well. So basically the controls that I was doing here with my mouse and keyboard, we want to be able to do with the AI as well. Yes, P-A-W-N is the right um, the right spelling for this type of pawn. Uh, although it might sound like something else. 
And so what we're having to do here is figure out the angle to move right and to move up. And the way we're currently doing this is in this function here, and we are getting, so this is slightly confusing and we haven't named things really, so we could give things a, um, a name. For example, what is the output of this pin? If I wanted to do that, what I can do is I can wrap that all up into a little function. So that's what I'm gonna do while we're, while we're reading this and talking about it. And I'm going to just make sure that all of this is self-contained. Select it, right click it, collapse it to function, and then I can give it a name. And in this case, what it is, is the vector to the destination. So that's the meaningful name, and I can also remove the execution pins for this by going over to the detail pane and hitting blueprint pure. So there, we've just gone and simplified that right down, say the vector to the destination. If we wanna know how that's implemented, how do you get a vector to the destination? It's quite simple. We get the actor location, we get the current destination, we subtract fairly straightforward. And then we normalize. Normalizing could be part of that, or it's all right on up here. So normalizing meaning that we go down, down to like unit vectors. <laughs> Perceptual lucidity. I like your spelling even better. The P-W-N. It's a pawn. I would say, isn't that pwn? I don't know. How do you pronounce P-W-N? That's slightly different, isn't it? Pawn. Anyway, to pwn someone, I would have said. Okay, so we've got this vector to the destination that's been normalized. We've got this forward vector, and then we do the cross product, which is this weird thing we were talking about in the last lecture, in the last lecture, in the last vid. So what we've got, if I just switch over to the camera view for a second, let me just do that. Oh. Um, is we've got two vectors and I've got handily some pens here to help me out. Let's see if I've got another pen. Ah, there we go. So one of these pens is our forward vector, like this. This other pen is our normalized vector to the destination. And the cross product is a really interesting thing because it always is at right angles to both of these vectors. So if you do a cross product of it, it returns a vector and it's at a right angle to those other two vectors, like so. And it's also the size depends on the angle between the two. So when they are right on top of each other, that's zero. And if you think about it, if they're right on top of each other, you don't actually know what is right angles to both. You don't know the direction. So it makes sense that they're both zero. Similarly, when they are pointing in exactly the opposite direction, they're also zero. And in between 90 degrees is when they are at their maximum size. And that's basically what we need to know about the dot product. Uh, because then we take, sorry, the cross product, and then the dot product is saying, essentially, if we had two unit vectors, like so, then the dot product would be the projection of one onto the other, and says how much they are, are they aligned, essentially. So what we're doing here, when we're fully aligned, it'll be one, when they're at 90 degrees to one another, that will be zero with the dot product. So the idea here is that in the angle to rotate, we are giving it, oh, where is this, the event graph, here we go. We're giving it something to dot product with. So this is Z, that's the up vector. And what we're doing then is we're dotting the result of our cross product. Remember our cross product being this thing, the right angle. Um, we're dotting that with the up vector, which basically means how much should I try and rotate around the up vector, which is our left and right, basically. If you imagine that you've got a little car, I don't know if this is a little notebook, but imagine it were a car, or actually I've got an airplane here. Imagine you have this airplane and you want to yaw the airplane left and right, like so then it's the same as saying I'm going to stick an axis through the top of this thing that is obviously this one's pointing up and I'm rotating it left and right. So that's the idea. That's why we're dotting it with the, with the up vector. Because imagine 
I've got my airplane, it's facing this direction. It wants to be facing in this direction through this axis. And we get a cross product that will come out fully in this direction. And so we dot with that and we get basically one. If our airplane wanted to be going upwards more, then our cross product would be at right angles to that, like so. And when we dot product that with the up vector, we get zero. Basically we're saying we're on the right heading, we just need to turn up, so there's no need to turn left or right. So the other bit of that is on the event graph, I have got the other, the other vector that we're dotting with is the y vector, which is basically the right vector, so it's that one. So it's telling us how much should we pitch the Dalek's body. So does that description make sense more or less? Yeah, I've got this lovely squishy plane from a uh, careers fair where Amadeus a... Uh, would it even focus on that? Yeah, there you go. So Amadeus are a... I think Ben would know better than me. They're a uh, avionics software company or something. People, someone knows better than I do. You can Google it. But yeah, got it at careers fair. Handy squishy plane comes in handy when you are trying to demonstrate uh, vectors and stuff. So one step that we could do here, if we're still not understanding this after my terrible, terrible explanation, <laughs> is that we might want to actually represent these vectors in the world so we can see them. And I think that's probably our next step to do a little bit of debugging, be able to see this vector here and this vector here and the result as the dot product as vectors in the world. So let's go ahead and do that. The way we can do this is with a draw, there's a draw debug node and we've got a draw debug node. Let's see, there are a few of these. You can draw all sorts of things from boxes, cameras, capsules, coordinate systems, whatever you fancy really. Uh, I'm going to go for the arrow because I think that's a natural representation and I'm going to be wrapping this up in a bit because the arrow is slightly weird. It has a line start and a line end which isn't quite what we want to do. We want to represent a vector so we want to represent it starting at our current location and we want it to, we just want to give the vector which is going to be the start location plus the vector is going to be the end location. So that's probably not very clear in the way I just described it. So let's try it again. So I'm going to get the pawn that we are controlling. And I'm going to get its locational position. Uh, what do they call it? We've just done this. Let's go and have a look. Get actor location. That's what we want. So, oh, this is getting the pawn at index zero. Now we want to get the controlled pawn. Uh, uh, I'm being a bit thick. Let's copy this. I don't know why I'm not getting these results. So we'll get the controlled pawn. I'm going to collapse this down into a function in a second. That's why I'm making a mess over here. Uh, so that's going to be the start location of our vectors. So they're just starting, located in the world at the actor's location at the pawn's location. And then on top of this we're going to add whatever vector we're trying to show, so it might be this normalized vector here. And normalized vector means that it's going to be one unit, and one unit in Unreal is one centimeter, which is absolutely tiny, so I'm going to have to actually multiply this by a float to make it significantly sized, so I'm going to multiply that by 100. And then we need, you can't just put that into the end because that would be a vector starting at 0, 0, going up to wherever the endpoint is. So what we actually need to do is add it to the line start. So this is why I find draw debug arrow and draw debug line slightly weird in Unreal, because it's not the way I tend to be using it. So let's add two vectors. Let's have one as the end, like so. Then we have to add in some sizes. So we're going to have, let's see, arrow size of two centimeters, thickness of one centimeter. We can leave the duration to zero. That will by default be one tick in length. And we can change the line color to something more visible, like bright red, like so. 
and let's go ahead and see whether we can see this normal. I'm going to F8 out, go towards our ship. Hmm. What's going on there? And not getting anything out. And that would be because I haven't put the execution pin through the draw arrow. So let's do that. Put the execution pin through, otherwise it's not going to execute, is it? Let's go ahead and hit play. F8, go and have a look at our spaceship. Okay, so now we're getting something. I'm seeing an arrow there. Seems to be pointing in the right sort of direction. Maybe I can pause. Oh, it won't draw while I'm paused. <laughs> That's annoying. There you go. So you can see this arrow is pointing back. It's a little bit small. Let's make it a bit bigger. Change our thickness to maybe five centimeters and 10 centimeters for the arrow head. Maybe we'll be able to see that now a bit more visibly. There you go. That's a bit more of a visible arrow. That arrow is pointing back towards the zero zero point at all times. Oh, trying to keep hold of this. There you go. Always pointing back towards zero zero. So let's, we can now wrap this up into a function. So I'll grab all these nodes. Notice I made them without any extraneous links, any extra links than we needed, just so that I could easily wrap it into a function. So I'm going to go right click, uh, collapse to function, and this is just going to be draw debug vector, something like that. And I can call the M input something like vector, like so. Okay, so that's going to draw a debug vector, and we probably want to add another input here, actually, one that is a color. Now, there are a few different types of color here, and the one we actually want is a linear color. How do I know that? Because if I go to this line color here, do, do, do it over and highlight it, then you see that it says line color, but underneath it, the line underneath says linear color structure. So what we want to do is make sure we can provide that in this function. So I'm going to look for color again as the argument type and make it a linear color. Give it a name as well and hook it up in the function like so, boom. And we can go to the, what's this function called? Angle to rotate on given axis. And yeah, so we're going to be able to give it a color here. Awesome, awesome source. So this one's going to be red, as we've already done. And I can do one for this forward vector. So we can just visualize all of this going on. I'm going to make that one green. Make sure I hook it up in the execution flow as well. And finally, I want another copy of this. I'm going to make a blue vector. I'm going to stop and take questions in just a second once I've done this, guys. Uh, or read the Q&A at the very least. Might not have any questions to answer. And that's going to be the cross product. And I'm going to finish the execution flow there. So let's go ahead and hit play. Uh, and where I can have a look at it. Let's go on in. There you go. Okay, so we've got green is the forward, red is the back. And what we can't actually currently see is the cross product vector. And I think the reason for this is that it's either underneath. Hmm. I'm not seeing the cross product vector at all. So what's going on there? Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. Maybe I'm just not seeing it at the right point. Maybe there is the cross product vector could be zero, could be very, very small. So let me just have a look in the chat and then we can come back to this. <laughs> Screen, sorry guys. You should give me a call, Ben. Oh dear. Right. So I will give you a recap of the last 10 minutes, guys. Definitely not getting any notifications. I guess I'm probably on do not disturb mode for a stream, ironically. 
There you go. So what is the recap of the last five minutes? So what I've been doing is putting together this draw debug vector function. So I don't know whether you are able to follow anything while I was just narrating. So let's have a look at this. What we've got is a draw debug arrow function here. And the draw debug arrow is what's responsible for showing these arrows. If I go up to this guy in the world, then you can see that there is a green arrow, a red arrow, and a blue arrow pointing off of it. And why are they different colors? Because we're providing different colors here in the function call to draw debug vector. Thanks guys for bearing with, by the way. Um, so we've got this arrow size and thickness, which is telling us basically how big we should make the arrow. And we have to put this arrow together like so. We start with a location for it to begin with. So if I've got an arrow, imagine this is a vector, this pen is a vector, and it has a start location which is here, and it has an end location which is here. So the end location is not the same as the vector. The end location would be the start location plus the vector. So that's what we're doing here. So we've got this start location which is where to essentially display the vector in a world, because by default if you just had a zero start location, it would be at the zero point in the world, so you can't really see anything there. Um, so we're going to do get the vector location, we add the vector to it, and that's the end location. And we're doing this multiplied by 100 because the world units are uh, in centimeters, so you wouldn't really be able to see anything otherwise. I'm just checking the chat persistently now because I'm worried I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> okay, so let's see. That's that's basically what's going on. And then in the angle to rotate on given axis, we are doing a draw debug vector for three different vectors for the normalized vector to destination and the forward vector and the cross product of the two. All right, so having discuss side discussions about Twitch down there. So this is what's currently going on. I think this is fairly clear. Now, what? let's try and visualize these cross product vectors. So I'm going to F8 out of here. And it's actually quite hard to see with the current location. Maybe I'll put the destination somewhere else because the destination being on the floor is a little bit hindering our understanding. I'm going to put the destination 20 meters up into the air as a default destination to try and get this AI to fly towards. Uh, I need to do it from the main editor window, F8 out. Okay, this is interesting. I don't know whether you saw that, but it did something very strange there. So we're heading up. For some reason, I don't quite understand why we're heading up. This is not 20 meters. 20 meters isn't very high in the air. Let me just prove that to you. I'm going to get this block and put it at the place that we're look trying to aim towards. So that's 20 meters in the air, by the way. So if I hit play and F8 out of here, this guy is going to come and hit the block and generally acting very, very erratically. So you can see that it's trying to tell us to turn up, but we're not turning up for some reason. Can you see this? Can you see that the blue vector is off to the left? And as per my airplane description, that means we should be turning up, and we seem to be turning the wrong way, basically. And I'm not entirely sure why.
I'm trying to follow this. It's quite hard to follow. Maybe with the F key I can keep on top of it. Yeah, so this is basically trying to tell us to turn up with this blue arrow. Do, 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 do. But what's also interesting is when you start heading down, <laughs> weird things are happening, basically. So we're in a bit of a dead end here, I think, with our cross product stuff. I was trying to make it work for a while before the stream and it's a little bit, a little bit tricky. Um, basically, I think it's a bit of a flaw in how we're doing things because if you think about it, if our plane is trying to head in one direction, I'm going to quickly go to full screen and I'm going to remember to go back this time. So if our plane is heading in one direction, but the destination is directly behind it, so it's going in the other direction, let me try and get that in, in focus and plane for you, then the cross product is actually going to be zero. So that means if you're heading exactly away from your destination, you're going to have no turn angle. And in fact, basically it means that the maximum turn angle is going to be when we're at 90 degrees. If we're a bit further away, then it's going to turn less and less and less and less until it's not turning at all. So this seems to have some erratic behavior. And what I was considering actually, just before the stream, is maybe we could have a look at the, if when we have our plane and we've got, let's see, our vector to the destination, it'd be interesting if we could just dot product that vector to the destination with something like the right vector. Because then we would know whether our destination is to the right or to the left of us, basically. And that seems like maybe a sensible idea, so I thought I'd give that one a go. Let's, let's give that a shot. So switching back to the screen this time, let's do that. Okay, so what, are, what is the question? Who are we talking to? Oh, Brian, so the goal here is to try and get our AI to try and navigate towards a point. That's basically the idea. We've got this flying, um, this flying Daleks that you can control with a, a pitch and a yaw, essentially. Um, or is it a roll and a yaw? I, I can't, I, I don't know. I think it's a pitch and a yaw, basically. So I can pitch and yaw, and I want our enemy AI to be able to update based on its position relative to its destination. That's what we're trying to do. That's filling you in. The end goal for the game, I think we're just trying to make something fun. We started off with this flying Dalek simulator, um, and a lot of this was already built in. We built in some kind of mechanism for firing lasers, which wasn't there before, and I can fire my lasers at this other Dalek. So let's go and follow this Dalek around and shoot him. There you go. He's dead. So that's what we've added in so far, and what we're trying to do now is make it so that the Daleks are a little bit more interesting, at least follow some sort of patrol route, have some sort of interesting AI, and that's what we're trying to work out now. Yeah, good detective work there, Bryant. Okay, so let's have a go with this dot product approach and see what any of the shortfalls are. So we don't need these debug vectors at the moment. Let's connect up our execution flow again. And I am showing the screen. Yes, I am. Good. I'm going to be checking this every two seconds now that I haven't switched back or something. And so we've got our forward vector. We've got the vector to destination. We do want the vector to the destination. Do we want it normalized? Yeah, it doesn't hurt. And then what we want to do is our input. Hmm. Do we want our input to be something like the left and right? Well, let's just take it as being hmm, the left and right from the pawn. 
So I'm kind of cutting this whole thing apart. I'm going to take out the cross product entirely, and we're just going to do a dot product with the vectors of the destination. So a reminder, that's basically the dot product is how much in line are these two vectors. So, and it's going to be, if they're perfectly in line like this, it's going to be, let's see, positive. And I think if they're perfectly out of line, they're going to be negative if they're going in opposite directions. Something to check, definitely something to check. Um, maybe Ben can correct me if I'm wrong there. So I'm going to go to the event graph and feed in here. Let's see, when I get the controlled controlled pawn player, which one is it? Control pawn, that's the one down here. And I want to get, for move right, I want the right axis. So I want the right vector of that pawn. That's what we're going to dot product there. And similarly, we're going to get for this other one, the up and down, so up vector. So we're not using the forward vector here at all. I'm sure there's no mistake. Perceptual lucidity, when they can navigate to a point, we can start setting waypoints, they can have a patrol system, they can come and try and attack the player, or at least swarm in on the player, stuff like that. Or uh, even try to escape from the player might be something to do. So there's a lot of things we can do once we can give them essentially a direction by giving them a destination to head towards. So it's just a general feeling that this is what the kind of is the next step is for it to be able to navigate towards things. Okay, so this is definitely not working. It is face planting into the ground at the moment. And maybe we want to have a look at what those floating values, floating point values coming out of here are. So our angle to rotate to give an axis, I want to log out. So we can do that with a print in the blueprint node. Let's get some execution flow in here. And by default, that's connected up to the duration. That's not what I want. Break that link. Let's connect it up to the string input, which requires an automatic conversion that it does for us. So if we go ahead and hit play, this should be in, on the move right and move left. So let's have a look. When it's upside down, I would expect it to have inverted its input, to be honest. It's a little bit confusing when it's going up and down. Let's remove the movement up and down from this. So we've just got one axis to worry about. I'm going to F8 out of here. Now that seems to be trying to do the right thing. We'll see how it tries to navigate on the ground by itself. Is it going to try and go around this zero, zero point? Okay. You know, I think we've got the same problem essentially because if they are, if the point is directly behind us, it's going to project on the right axis as zero. So we're very much gonna have the same problem as we were having with our cross product. You'd imagine there would be an easier way of doing this. <laughs> Driving under the influence patrol, indeed. Just totally destroying all the Daleks that are drunk. Um, so, one way I could try and just eliminate this problem is to just take it as a positive or negative thing. So, we either turning left or turning right. And I could do that by... Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm getting a bit stuck for options here, to be honest. Without a prototype and without scratching my head for quite a while, 
we might come back to this one. Sadly, that might be the, the only option right now. Unless someone's got some suggestions to make. So it's a watch Sam think stream at the moment. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the process with something like this just involves me sitting there and scratching my head for an hour and drawing diagrams on paper that I throw away. So <laughs> it can be very hard, as Ben is saying, to think with an audience. And part of this is actually a restriction put in place by Blueprint because it doesn't seem to have the same, this, the same level of control as in C++ for these kinds of things. But most of the time you're fine, but it doesn't have certain functions to do with vectors where I would like it to be able to tell me what's the angle between vector X and vector Y and it doesn't do that and I can build a system for that but I have to I don't know I'd have to think quite deeply about what I'm doing to make sure it works in all the edge cases and that can be quite difficult and yes, that we do generally put a lot of this thought into the course before we even record a video. So this is why there's a lot of thought process going on. Anyhow, I'm going to back out of this for a bit and then maybe on the next stream we can have a look um, and try and dig deeper into this exact question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to our flying game mode and no, it's not in the flying game mode. I think it's actually in the flying pawn itself it tells us which AI class it should use over here in the details pane. So the flying AI controller is what it's currently using. I'm just going to go and set that to the default flying controller, which is what it was before we changed it in the last lecture, which basically means that now these guys are going to just go on level flight like so. And that should be all right. So I think that's what we're going to aim for at the moment. Um, and I find it really frustrating to leave a problem. So what are your suggestions, guys, for the rest of the stream? What should we head towards? Yeah, Brian, it would be a good um, situation to use C++, but the point of this stream series really is to use Blueprint um, and show how much you can do with Blueprint. It is, it is the kind of situation where you would do C++ in general, but we can solve this sort of problem in Blueprint. I just need to scratch my head for a bit more. So there's no fundamental limitation. There's no actual API that we aren't allowed to call. It's just that some of the helper functions that are there in C++ aren't there in the Blueprint. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to drop down to C++. It might just mean that you have to write yourself a Blueprint helper function. And if you know how to do that, which currently on the stream I can't, I can't figure out, but I will, um, figure out on paper later on. Exactly, Ben. Yeah, the underlying maths is exactly the same. So there shouldn't be any reason that we have to um, avoid this sort of thing. Perceptual lucidity. Yes, the blueprint does allow you to have the um, AI functionality, um, but the AI functionality doesn't necessarily include things like as specific as how to fly a plane. That kind of stuff you have to figure out. And then from there, your the AI functionality in the engine is stuff like defining more meta behaviors. So I'm in patrolling mode. That means I go between point A, point B, point C. 
when I detect that there's an enemy, then I go and chase that enemy. If the enemy's shooting at me, then I try and run away. That kind of stuff is what you do in the Blueprint AI system. You tweak those behaviors and the conditions for moving between those behaviors. But how the actual kind of control feedback loop of uh, directing and steering your plane, that's definitely something that you need to define first, and then the AI system can use all that information at a higher level to say, okay, well, I want to go to point A, point B, and point C. And that's what I'm thinking of when we're trying to implement it. <laughs> Ben's just saying I'm a bit thick. I think he's taunting me, but I'm not going to take the bait. So, um, what shall we do next? Because we've got ourselves a laser. We've got ourselves some AI that is currently a bit dumb and we're going to fix that. We know that that's a problem. And we can tail this AI, we can shoot at it. Maybe we want a scoreboard. Maybe that's the next sort of thing. Let's see. What do you guys think is the more interesting thing to add to this game right now? Do mention it in the comments. Thanks, Kenneth. <laughs> All right, so um, let's try and do the chill option of putting in some scoring system. So this is going to dive into Unreal's very powerful UI system. Let's give that a shot. Let's see whether, how much of that I can remember off the bat. Okay, so uh, it's a, U, a UMG is the UI system. Uh, we've got we can right click and do stuff in the content browser, and we can create go into user interface and we can create this blueprint widget, and that's what I'm going to do. Unsurprisingly, and I am going to try and rename it but it's not wanting to. Hmm. That blueprint widget is not happy. Maybe I need... So this is one of the beauties of Unreal. Sometimes you just have to restart the engine and there's no two ways about it. So hopefully that will allow me to rename the blueprint afterwards. Um, I'm definitely in a very funny position at the moment with Unreal and Unity um, because I'm diving into the RPG at the moment for the, those of you who don't know. And... I've just come from Unreal. So on the one hand, I'm like, wow, isn't it amazing I don't have to compile things and the editor basically doesn't really crash very often. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm like, wow, I miss nested blueprints. Well, I, I miss blueprints and their flexibility and blueprint inheritance and all that good stuff that comes with Unreal. I miss the fact that it's got a save system built right in and all that sort of stuff. So it's really interesting to have both of these editors because you really want to bring the features for, that you had in another editor with you and programming into the editor is always a good thing. Anyway, rant over. As you can see, the blue, um, blueprint widget was not created. Let's go and add new again, go to the user interface, uh, blueprint widget, and I'm gonna, I always put a prefix of WBP for blueprint widgets. It's just a part of a star guide that we use. And this one's going to be the heads up display. Okie dokie. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And then you're going to see more of the depth of the Unreal Editor because we've got this whole UI editor just hiding away that until you've got a blueprint widget you don't even know exists. Schizophrenic Euphoria, for now, the VR course is um, done. Um, I say we had talked about a third section. We're putting that on pause for the time being, but there is so much content in there already. I think there's over 25 hours of content in total. So let me know when you get to the end of that, if there's anything that you feel is missing from it, because I feel like we've covered a lot of the stuff that was going to be in a third section already in object interaction, because essentially we've got that climbing mechanism, we have got our whole kind of drawing in midair mechanism going on in the VR course. 
So I'd be interested to know what you'd think is missing after you finish the 25 hours that's already there. <laughs> On pause, Ben says. Alrighty then, so we're going to have a look at how to create a little bit of UI. So you've got a whole bunch of widgets over on the left hand side. You've got a hierarchy here of the widgets just underneath and then you've got detail panes we're going to show up in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in, let's see, a text box. Uh, no, not text box, but text widget which you can drop in and you notice that it goes under this canvas panel as part of the hierarchy. The canvas panel is what's responsible for laying out the things underneath it. And it does this in, in a number of ways. But if I expand out this details pane, you can see that you can change the anchors. Uh, in fact, you could drag the anchor around if you wanted to, but that's a little bit haphazard. So what you can do is you can go for a few different anchor presets. So you can anchor it to the top left, anchor it to the top right. I'm gonna anchor it to the top right which basically means that if I then rescale my window, no matter what size my window is, that text block stays at the top right. So that's what I'm gonna go for. I'm going to rename this text block to the score, like so. And then I can put another text block next to it. Uh, did I just copy and paste that? I'm not sure, there you go. I had to copy it and then select the canvas panel and paste it so that it knows what I'm pasting it under because otherwise it was trying to paste it underneath the text and text can't have any children in UI. So I'm going to right align this text, the score, so that we can put them next to each other. And then this dude, he is going to be a placeholder score for now, something like 12. Okay, so that gives us a system to work with and we're going to take this heads up display and try and display it for the main player. Now the best way to do that, where would be the best kind of code execution place for this? I'm actually going to do it in the level blueprint itself. So for this level it's going to spawn up the heads up display. Let me just check in on the chat for a second. Thanks, Schizophrenic, you for it. Yeah, it is now 24 hours, and um, I, it, it felt like it to me when I was right <laughs> recording all of them. Um, but yeah, I'm glad it doesn't feel like it to you. That means it's fun and enjoying it. I assume you've... Um, have you have you actually got to the end of the content? I'm really interested in knowing whether you've got to the end of the content or you're just... How, what percentage of the way through are you? Yeah, what's up next is finishing off the RPG Bryant, so it's really not just relaxing with my feet up. It is uh, taking, finishing a big project and uh, starting with an even bigger one. When we hit something else, we lose health. Yes, we can definitely do health. I'm going to do, put the UNI in first for keeping score, and then we can add a health mechanism on top of that. Uh, we can extend it out, but let's do one thing at a time. So if I go to the Blueprints menu, then I can actually go to Open the Level Blueprint. So the level itself has code associated with it. And in this Level Blueprint, I think we can go and create a Begin Play event. There we go. So when we begin play, this is the same as Start on Unity, on the Unity end. Then with Begin Play, we are going to go ahead and create this heads-up display now. Or oh, let's see if I can remember how this is done. So we have to create the widget, that's like so. We select the class that we want to make, which is going to be this heads-up display. The owner, the player owner, is we're just going to get the player, and it should be, do, 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 do. I think get player controller index zero. So basically, the zeroth player is going to be the owner of the widget that we are creating. Righto. Then we are going to need to display it. So has something to do with the viewport. I seem to remember that. I'm doing this from memory, but often you'd go to the documentation for this. Add to viewport. Let's see if that works. Have we got something we can see? Hurrah! Wow, off the top of my head. There you go. So we've got ourselves a score 
that is visible from where we currently are. All right, so the next thing is where is that score actually going to be located? Now, I think the right place for this sort of data is actually in a player state object. So let's see if we can create a blueprint player state. So we've got player controller, player pawn, and I believe the player state class just gets created by Unreal automatically. Um, if it doesn't, then we might have to rethink things. So this is going to be the flying pawn state, like so. And I need to go to the game mode blueprint. I'm going and opening it a different way here. Maybe. No. Let's go to the file for the flying game mode. And you can see here there is a state class, player state class, and we can choose the flying pawn state class instead. So that's what it's going to spawn up when creating the flying pawn, I think. Let's go ahead and hit play. And if I have a look in the world outliner, I would expect to see the flying pawn state. Hmm. So far, no, no good. Oh, there you go. There's a flying pawn state. So the object's been created automatically by Unreal in our world outliner. So what I want to do is put a little bit of state variable in there and then have a way of reaching out of the HUD. And let me just read the questions for a second. Make health. Read that. Yeah, so, um, is it Mall Ninja? Mall Ninja Max. Yes, the player state object is, in fact, just an empty class that you should be able to put variables into. Um, the, now, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head why you use the player state versus other things. I believe, unlike the pawn, in a multiplayer game, the pawn exists on all of the clients and the server. The player controller is the thing that is in control of the pawn. That exists, if I remember correctly, only on the client, whereas the player state exists only on the server. So any state that you want to keep track of about the player sh that really should just exist on the server and not be synchronized everywhere is there in the player state class. I think that's the idea. But it might just be a way of compartmentalizing things. Um, and meaning that your pawn can get destroyed. Yes, I think that's right. It's so that your pawn can die, but your score persists. So if you die, then your score carries on. Basically, I think that's the idea. Decoupling the state about a player from the actual physical representation of that player in the world. Um, I'm not making this multiplayer, but Unreal's got all the multiplayer stuff built in, so you might as well work towards their standards but as I said I think actually this isn't to do with multiplayer at all because I think the player state is replicated to all of the clients in exactly the same way as the pawn is replicated because if you think about it all the clients might need to know about that state I can't remember off the top of my head I would have to go and look it up in the documentation okie dokie so we've got our player state class let's go and um open it up. So I've got a bit of a mess on the file system here. I'm not very good at keeping things organized while doing things live. So I'm afraid this is a bit messy, but hopefully you'll forgive my mess. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create a variable in this pawn state class. I have to be careful how to say these things in Unreal. Um, and then we're going, it's going to be an integer for the score. Oh doesn't want to rename for some reason. Score is already used by something. Hmm. Let's just call it the player score then. Like so. And then we can create a public... I don't know whether this is 
pardon me, publicly accessible by default. Uh, we can make it private. Let's just keep it, hmm. Yeah, let's make it private. And let's make it so that we've got a getter for it. So I'll have a function here, uh, get score, and it will have an output, which is going to be the score, which is going to be the integer. And it's going to be pure, so that we don't have any execution pins on this function. And then I can just output the player score for it. OK, so that's one thing. And then I want to connect this up to an actual score on the HUD. So to do this, I can go into the graph side of the widget blueprint editor. And you notice there's this designer and graph thing. The graph is basically your code. The designer is the visual layout. OK, so let's do go into the graph. And I think. There's no reason why we couldn't do this on every event tick, but actually there's a kind of neater way. If I select the thing that I want to, in essence, bind to a value, then selecting the score, I can go ahead, scroll on down. Uh, somewhere here is a, there should be a bind. There's a few binds, really, but we need to do it next to the value that we want to change. And in this case, it's the text contents. What we've currently got set to 12, I want to bind to a value. So I can go ahead and create a binding like this. And you see it creates this function called get text. I can actually rename to get score or something like that. And then we can return some text out of this function. And that will, every frame, update the value there in the HUD. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is get hold of our player. In fact, we can get the owning player, which we know is player zero. And we should be able to get his state, get player state from there. Fabulous. It's working well so far. Now, we're going to have to cast this state. Yuck, but hey-ho, uh, because we don't have any more ca information there. So it's going to be the flying player state. And only if that succeeds are we going to then query it further to get the score, like so. So this is a bit lighter indeed than all that cross product business we were doing earlier here. And that's automatically doing a conversion from an integer to the text value of that integer, presumably in decimal, we'd hope. So let's go ahead and hit play. And sure enough, our score starts off at zero. Just to show you that the state is doing that job, if I go into our state class and give the state score a default value of five, for example, then I can go ahead and hit play, and the value on the HUD is also 5. Fantastic. So the stream, stream dropped. Back on. So, OK, guys, uh, sorry about that is all I can say without doing some more analytics. On my end, it hasn't dropped, or it's not reporting a drop. So do... Let me know if that's for everyone. OK, so it seems like a few of you had it for a bit, came back on. Did it just buffer or did it die? actually look like it stopped completely? I'm enjoying Streamlabs. I, I don't know, it feels a bit more polished than OBS. Um, it just looks like they've taken OBS and made it a bit more polished, which I like. OK, so what we want now is some way to update this player state every time we actually destroy something. Because what's the point of it if it's just going to stay static? OK, so I'm just going to set the default value to zero. And the thing that knows whether we destroyed anything is our laser. And if you remember way back when we first created this laser system and we had our flying pawn create it. Let's go over to the flying pawn. Do, 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 do. Where do we have our fire laser? 
and it creates this laser actor and it sets itself as the instigator. So this laser has some way of referring back to the player, which is good because what I want to do next is for the laser, when it kills something, I want it to find its owner, find its state and attribute basically or incre increment the score. So from the state, we're going to need to expose a method to increment the score. Let's do that. This one should be easy. All we're going to do is get our player score and increment it, which ooh, I don't know. We have a plus equals kind of operator here. Increment int. Huh, looks like it. that might do it. Add one to the specified value, then set it. Great. That seems to do the trick, and I bet that's a macro in here somewhere. Oh man, I don't even want to look at that. <laughs> Let's not look at that macro. That looks ugly as sin. Right. So we were here, we've created an increment score. We want to go to our laser. And our laser, when it destroys an actor, after it's successfully destroyed the actor, we want to go ahead and get our instigator. Boom, like that. Now our instigator, we happen to know, should be a flying pawn. Mm, yeah, it should be a flying pawn. Uh, so we can cast it as such like that. And then we need to get from that flying pawn the state class. And sadly, we've got to cast that too to the flying pawn state class. And then once we've cast that to the flying pawn state class, we can increment the score like so. So let's hook up all those execution pins, a few places that could fail. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and wrap this all up in increment score into a function called increment score rather locally so that basically what we're saying is destroy and then increment the score and then if you want to see the details you can dig into increment score to see the details so let's go ahead and save and let me just answer some questions <laughs> okay so my stream is rock solid it's just been messing around the only problem happens when i forget to read the chat and, and show any of my face do not press the big red button issues oh yes okay so i'm going to chase down this enemy ship and see if i can get it to increment my score oh i missed it there we go and the score's gone up by one as you can see in the top right corner so that's proved that we can get hold of from the laser our pawn it has proved that we can increment the state from there and it shows that at runtime, we're able to update this HUD. And I don't know, what, um, what was the end time for this stream? Because that feels like a really good wrap up time and a time just to answer some of your questions. Uh, what have I got here? Yeah, it feels like it's a good time to wrap up. We've implemented the HUD. We can look at health next time. We can look at how to actually improve that AI behavior. So I'm going to hide my screen now and just show my face, hopefully. And you guys can ask me some uh, wonderful questions. Can can we build can you build a game RPG by Unreal, same as Infinity Blade clone with simple graphics in your free time? Yeah, well, depends on the feature set of your RPG, right? So if you keep a really restricted and, and also <laughs> depends on how long you want to spend working on it, because if you spend a decade working on it, then you could probably do quite a lot in a decade but the question is probably whether you can do it within a reasonable time frame of a year or two uh, in your spare time and also depends on how much spare time you have if you have like one hour a day you might not get very far if you've got a two three hours a day you might get a lot further um, and your level of experience so this is like a, it really really depends question but it, I think it should be possible for you with Infinity Blade assets to get somewhere 
Um, and they've now got that RPG um, starter example on, on the, in the engine. I'm trying to figure out where I might find that, actually. Uh, maybe in the learn section of the engine. They definitely had, with 4.20, uh, introduced some new cool stuff. So let's have a look at the feature samples. So they've got this digital human feature sample, which is awesome that you can even download that and try it out. I'm sure you need a very good graphics card for this. Uh, face AR, virtual camera. So they've got loads of cool new feature samples. This is a great way of teaching yourself some of the more advanced features in Unreal, by the way, is going ahead and getting hold of their feature samples. Um, I'm not showing the screen again, am I? Let's show you the screen. So where I am is currently in the Epic Games launcher and under the Learn tab, and if you scroll down, they've got this engine feature sample. Uh, Dave Bates, the best way to get in contact with us about complex questions is to become a tier three subscriber or a mentor subscriber because com complex questions obviously take us a long time to answer and dig into. And if you become one of our premium subscribers, then you can come on to live streams with us and we answer those questions live for the benefit of everyone rather than just for the benefit of you. So that's what we're trying to aim to make it more beneficial for everyone. And obviously it's time consuming, so we can't offer that level of service to everyone as much as we'd love to. Uh, so I'm just looking in here, I thought, that they had done an RPG project in here. I'm not seeing it off the bat. Oh, there's more down here. Gameplay concepts. So we've got a turn-based strategy game, uh, blueprint spline tracks. There's all sorts of cool features that you can learn how to use by looking at these projects. Games. Okay, maybe it's under games. We've got a strategy game. That's so cool. Vehicle game, shooter game. It's not seeming to show up here. I know that they had it though, so let's have a look. Do, do, do. Aha, this is it, Action RPG by Epic Games. So you can go ahead and download this pack as a starting point. This is a long answer to your question, by the way. Go ahead and download this from the asset pack and have a play around and see how they've gone about creating this. And I don't know how much of this is in C++ versus Blueprint, um, utilizing C++ and Blueprint together in this UE4 project. So this is pretty cool um, and definitely something that's worth having a look at. You've got all sorts of special ability systems, um, health bars, loads and loads of stuff in here. So you know, pick that apart and do with it as you will. Uh, exception handling, good question, perceptual lucidity. Not that I know of. Um, I mean, you can you can do all sorts of uh, guard statements, no problem in Blueprint. That's, that's not an issue uh, because, you know, you could return null from things. You've got the idea of branches, which are the same as if statements. So if you've got a null return value which you can query for example I could query that this is not null by doing a valid which gets a, a boolean return value and then I can branch on that so there's loads of ways of doing this and in fact exceptions are nice to have in programming languages but are not strictly necessary because basically languages like C manage just fine without them and in a lot of languages you don't use them like C++ because they're not very efficient so uh, there isn't really an exception mechanism that I know of, and I don't think there is um, at all, but you can get away just fine with it by using if statements and so on and so forth. So the, the idea there being in certain programming languages, you have a paradigm called um, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, um, where basically you will attempt to do an operation. If it fails, it gives you an exception, and then you handle the exception when you get the exception. Pro programming languages like Python do that a lot. Um, however, in programming languages like C and C++ that are more performance-oriented, you don't do that. You use a paradigm called look before you leap, 
and look before you leap is basically saying before I go and open a file I'm going to make damn well sure that that file exists and it has the content that I want or that it has, I have the permissions to open it in the way that I want. And then you go ahead and do the operation. So it's just flipping around the way it works. And it is slightly harder to do a look before you leap approach because you have to think of all the edge cases. But it is generally more performant to do it that way for all sorts of reasons that I don't think I'll go into right now. <laughs> yeah, so we're probably not going to make an RPG course in Unreal is the honest answer. And Anne, I'm just going to call you Anne, um, not try and pronounce the last bit, sorry. Um, reason being, it has been hard enough to, to get halfway through our current Unity RPG project. Um, doing one in Unreal is very advanced. Um, not really something that's going to appeal to a very wide audience, unfortunately, and that has, you know, the currently the way we sell our courses, they have to appeal to a large audience for us, for them to be viable for our time, because we could be teaching so many more people in other spheres. So basically, I'm afraid we're probably not going to do that one, but do take our other courses, learn to read code, and then go and download these template projects. And that basically is the best way to learn. People like me, people like Tom Lumen, who is another eminent guy in the blue, uh, in the teaching Unreal space, did not go about learning Unreal by taking on online online courses. We learnt how to code. We learnt the principles of coding, which we teach through our courses, and we use engines like Unreal to teach you the principles of coding. But then we went and learnt Unreal by looking at the example projects, by looking at the engine code and piecing it together. So that is a really, really good way of learning more advanced content and I really recommend it. Don't wait for us to build an RPG course so that you can fulfil your dream of making an RPG. Go and learn the skills of reading code and then you can teach yourself to make an RPG and I think that is the really valuable takeaway. Craig Wizard, what kind of YouTube videos are you looking for that aren't already there? Um, that's kind of the problem I have. A lot of the videos for basic stuff like making a menu already exist and are done quite well. Is there something in particular that you're interested in? And at Maul Ninja's suggestion also to Anne is that you can try out the quick um, you can you can do the RPG uh, Unity course and try and apply it to Unreal with Unreal Knowledge. Uh, is that what's your name? O T V R O T R V O T R V. I'm afraid I don't know just yet when we're going to improve the testing grounds thing. I really want to um, improve that section. It's a matter of pride for me that I think we can do that a lot better. Um, but at the moment, we've got a lot of things that do need improving, including the uh, that need working on, including the RPG. And the RPG is going to be my first priority for right now. And then we're going to circle back to testing grounds to improve that. So hopefully, there's you know there's been updates on that course, and that's just, I'm trying to show you that there's like really goodwill on that. Um, but the the testing grounds project is a mammoth in itself, as you as you probably have seen. It's it's well over a hundred lectures, um, and many many hours. And I I want to do a restricted version of that, but done better and faster because I think we spent a lot of time basically faffing around, and we could do we could go much more directly to it. But if you're interested in first person shooter mechanics, um, do go ahead and have a look. I'm gonna be very heavily basing uh, the the new testing grounds 
off of the shooter game example project because they, that's a very good way of architecting a first-person shooter or even a third-person shooter. And if you feel confident enough, go and download that project and have a look through how that code base is architected, particularly around, well, take a question-based mentality, right? Pro start producing your game. When you come up to something you're not sure how to do, go and look in their project and see how they're doing it and then try and internalize why that makes sense and then go and implement it for yourself and that's an approach I would take in the meantime before testing grounds is redone go and um, have a look at the shooter game and try and recreate the well create a shooter not the shooter game not the whole thing but create a first person shooter implementing as many of the mechanics from the shooter game as you want to include in your own version how to make a save game feature in unreal or unity I think both of those are quite valid questions, to be honest, because uh, Unity makes it really hard. Unreal, there aren't too many tutorials on. Um, and I've got some ideas about that. So maybe maybe we'll do an Unre um, a YouTube series on save game, both in Unreal and Unity. Let me know which one is more interesting to you guys. Give a shout in the chat. OTRV. Well, I've I've just finished creating an Unreal Un, um, Unreal VR course, so um, and an Unreal multiplayer course. So we've got a lot of Unreal content going in. Well, just literally just finished it, and we're thinking that we actually need to give a bit more love to the Unity guys at the moment because I've just finished producing two courses back to back. I've, that's literally what I've been doing since well since I finished testing grounds actually. So I've finished Testing Grounds, I did an Unreal multiplayer course, I did an Unreal uh, VR course, and now I'm actually going back to doing Unity again. So um, it's you Unreal guys have had quite a lot of love. Maybe you're not on those courses, but also you know Unity guys over on the RPG aren't necessarily on um, the RPG courses either. Thank you, Perceptual Lucidity, for giving the answer that I wanted to give. Um, maybe you didn't. No, I'm just reading the greater than or equal than signs. Um, so what, what's Ben always say that Unreal's better than Unity, Godot's better than Unreal, and Unity's better than Godot or something like that. Um, <laughs> but basically there's a circular dependency. Basically there's no one engine that's better than anything else. Learn them both and then you can find, you'll know what projects they're good for and what projects they're not good for. I'd say Unity for very small teams is excellent because you've got very rapid iteration. You can work in C Sharp, um, get things done really quickly. Unreal can be a bit of a beer moth sometimes. It can be very hard to learn stuff. It's hard, hard, not very well documented. So for a beginner, Unity can be a lot better. In a big team, Unreal is absolutely fabulous in terms of all the tooling it provides you. Um, it gives you a lot more stuff than Unity. It, well, Unity is trying to ca is catching up. So, uh, if I give you any feature X, then Unity might have it at some point. But things that I currently know they don't have is they don't have a saving system built in. Unreal does. They don't have any kind of concept of overriding of prefabs. And I know that one is coming, but they currently don't have it. And Unreal's pretty much had it from the beginning that you can override blueprints, you can nest blueprints, you can do all that great stuff. No problem at all. Unity, that's still coming and it's still in beta and it's been coming for years. Um, but it, I think it is finally coming this year. And that's going to be amazing when it comes, but it's currently not there and it's currently unstable, etc., etc. So Unity on big projects probably might have a... Um, Unreal, sorry, on big projects might have an advantage. On smaller projects and smaller teams and more beginner people, probably I'd give the... I'd give the crown to Unity. But Godot is definitely something to have a go at as well. If you've not got on with Unity in the past, Godot can be really good for beginners. Um, and obviously it's not as full featured an engine, but it might be full featured enough for the kinds of games that you want to create. And maybe the kinds of games that you should be creating if you want to be a successful indie developer starting off. That's just my two cents. Anyway, don't take that as a kind of complete answer. Go ahead and learn both, all three, 
and see which ones you like best. Um, OTVR, so you ignore the VR course because you don't have a headset. Um, please don't. Um, I wish I had a better answer to this. Try it without the headset and see if you can extract value from it nonetheless, because there's a lot of good stuff in there. And it's a real shame that <laughs> that I've had to cover that stuff in the VR course. I had to cover it there because I was doing the VR course and I needed that information and we hadn't covered it elsewhere yet. And I, I can't just go and create another project in the Unreal course. It would take too much time and it's hard to work into the syllabus. So there's a lot of good stuff in there, like save systems are included in the Unreal VR, system, um, Unreal VR course, uh, which I couldn't include um, elsewhere. And... Well, hadn't been included elsewhere and I needed for the Unreal course and lots of other good stuff like splines and lots of really intricate deep features about Unreal. So do try and take the Unreal VR course and I know you don't have a headset but um, try and work around that fact and uh, let me know and uh, like get involved in the Q&A and say how you're trying to get to do it um, and share that with other students. That would be really, really very useful. Um, so Perceptual Lucidity is saying about the save game, use their JSON API with some custom wrapper classes. Um, yeah, I mean, we could talk about that a bit more in detail. Um, but I've had issues with their built-in serialization, basically. And you want to be able to control what you serialize and what you don't. You don't want to serialize everything that is serializable by unity we want to say specifically for example the example from the rpg on a character the only thing that really matters is its position and whether it's dead maybe um you don't really care which way it's rotated at the beginning of the game you don't care what its animation state is so all that stuff shouldn't be serialized because you might want as the designer to change that um, have freedom to change that code and patch it in an update and for the save games still to work uh, that the that the users have made um, so that's a reason for not using the JSON API. And in fact, Unity themselves don't recommend using it for their save systems. They talk about using C Sharp's built-in serialization system and the binary formatter and things like that. So you do have to build a kind of system on top of all that stuff, which isn't too hard to do, but it does take a little bit of thinking about the architecture, and that's something we're going to cover in the RPG. Yep, uh, Operation Gamma, then, yep, we can use annotations to influence that sort of stuff. Um, but you can only, well, let's see. So what I want is a distinction between serialized field, which gets serialized into a scene file, into a prefab, and that's important from the design perspective, and then fields that are part of the save game. So you would take the... Uh, you would only include those in the save game, basically a subset. Or maybe not even a subset. Maybe, for example, things like starting health is something that goes in the save game, but is not actually a serialized field. It's not something that you set in the editor. You set a max health that then initializes the uh, current health, but we don't serialize that in the editor, but we do serialize it in the save game. So you need a different set of annotations for the things that go in the save game versus the things that need to be serialized in the editor. And that's what I'm talking about, basically. So I uh, have thought about doing that. Basically, we're going down an approach where you create a savable interface, and that savable interface basically passes in a dictionary, and then you put the data that you want to serialize into that dictionary in a serializable format, and it will serialize it out to disk. So it's basically, you could then build an annotation system on top of that as well, but I'm going to stop short of that because then that requires you to know quite advanced reflection features of the engine, and you can do without it, basically. It's not that much more boilerplate to do it without the annotations.
yes, Operation Gamma, yes, but the mono behaviors um, themselves just can't, you can't serialize them using C sharp serialization system for various reasons. Um, but yes, you can an use annotations to, to make it clear which ones you can and can't serialize. All right, so I think we are at its time. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, for your questions. Really sorry about the 10 minutes where I was just talking with my face up and you weren't seeing the screen. Hopefully you all got a recap um, well enough of that. Um, and thanks for bearing with me in spite of those hiccups. It seems that otherwise our stream's been pretty stable other than the, the idiot in front of the keyboard. So thank you guys very much for your time. And I'll hang around a little bit in the chat afterwards after the stream has stopped just to answer a couple more questions if they come in. Um, but otherwise, thank you and good night.